This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 264, recorded on December 20th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, is today the is the solstice or something like that? Oh, yeah. It's, just, uh, it's either today Plus. or tomorrow. It's generally right around the 21st. Winter solstice it would be, Winter right? solstice, yeah. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How are you? Okay, it's foggy here. <laughs> and I think that might explain the little icon on my weather app, which is a bunch of horizontal oh, is that what that gray means? lines. I don't know. I wrote to them and said, what is this icon a couple of days ago? And they haven't answered me yet. Yeah, I've seen that, and I don't know what it is either. I don't have any today. Today we have uh, sunny and 8 degrees. Let's yeah, just... we have um, um, mostly sunny and um, uh, 53.2 Fahrenheit. Whoa. <clears throat> it's only 39 here. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy. <laughs> How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. What's your Hi, tank? Kathy. Hi, Alan. Hey, Rich. Hello? Uh-oh, he's got holiday spirit. Yeah, I'm <laughs> almost out of here. Already hitting the holiday Where are you going, to so Oregon? Going to Oregon on Sunday. Wow. And you're going to go skiing and break your collarbone? Uh, no, I'm going to go skiing. I am not going to break my collarbone. I've already done that. Oh, that Once, was that uh, was snowboarding. That was that the was thing. Snowboarding. Uh, I I probably won't snowboard unless I get a day by myself because I'm not good enough at snowboarding to keep up with the skiers. I will probably ski most of the time. Now was but that a year ago? Any, Sorry, that was last March. Okay. So I was, and I was just thinking this morning that it has taken <laughs> until just a couple of weeks ago to get to the point where I think. I, uh, I'm really 100% in that shoulder. It takes a long time for an old guy. And so now it's time to get back on the ski slopes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> just just time. Well, if you get uh, any internal injuries out there, you can get an Oregon transplant. <laughs> an Oregon uh, transplant. Ooh. Hey, wait a minute. Because I, mean, I know you don't want to hear this, but it's 77 degrees Fahrenheit here. Uh, and wispy clouds. 51 to 51% humidity, 2.58 degrees. It is gorgeous. Absolutely mm-hmm. gorgeous. Cool. Well, not really, but <laughs> Hey, Warm. I want to I want to tell everyone what's going on in my life. All okay? right. Cuz I've okay. had so many changes in the last month. No one will believe it. So So my right. wife uh, my wife has worked at Merck for 27 years, got laid off a couple of weeks ago. Oops. Oh. So she interviewed, and on her first interview, got a job working for a little biotech. And um, there's a lesson here. It's in North Carolina. Oh. <laughs> so she's working there Monday through Thursday every week. Um, so the lesson is you have to be flexible in science. I'll say. <laughs> now, we have three kids, but they are in their teens, and you know, I think they can handle it. But it's an interesting mm-hmm. experience. Yeah, wow. but uh, I am rather busy from Monday to Thursday. Just all the stuff that she used to do now I have to do. Yeah, yeah single dad. Uh, the other thing is our son Devin had surgery a couple of weeks ago, mm. and he's okay. He's uh, he's absolutely recovered now and uh, doing well. Um, what else? So I think my wife has to have surgery, but major mm. surgery. But she can't because she started a new job, mm. so she has to put it off. Wow. Um, I think there's something else I'm missing. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll think of it. Anyway. Uh, that's, that's enough. I got a lot yeah. of stuff going on here. I'm yeah, a little tired. I'll... I need a break. I'm going to take a vacation. Mm-hmm. Good idea. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Wow. Wow. We have all email today because we mm-hmm. didn't get much done last time. Right. Um, last, last episode, by the way, very popular. Lots of downloads. I don't know why. We were talking about it in the pre-show. <laughs> the pre-show. Right. Wondering if it was the title. Got to be the title. 
we'll, got to be the title. We'll do some experiments to see if that's the case. Uh, we have a little follow-up, a couple of follow-up emails. Stephen uh, writes with respect to Cassie's email. Cassie was a dancer, I believe, yeah. who uh, wanted to do science. She wanted to know how to do it. So Stephen says, Cassie might want to take a look at Shonke Johnson's website. Kathy, is that how you say that? Uh, I think so, yeah. Here's a bio page. It's also a sample of his beautiful lab website, and he gives a link to that. Also, Johnson's advice for potential graduate students seems relevant. Another lo- another link. That's a good link. That is a uh, really excellent link. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the, it's uh, concise and right on the money. It's and that's not good. just for Cassie. That's anybody who is thinking of going to graduate school should mm-hmm. Take a look at this particular advice, even if you have no interest in what this uh, what this particular professor does, and you're not going to Duke. Yeah, <laughs> just have your fun now. Nice. Yes. <laughs> hey, I'm still having fun. Every mm-hmm. and I would guess everyone on this podcast is having fun. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But if you've got, if you, I mean, he makes he makes some very good points about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. If you want to go trekking in Nepal, it's probably not going to happen while you're a graduate student. And it's not going to happen after either. <laughs> so, yeah. I remember when I first started here, one of the first students who was interested in working in my lab, he came to talk about it and he said, I just want you to know that science is not my life. I have other things to do. Mm. And so I said, you better go do those other things because it's not going to work out. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't work in my lab. It wasn't you, Alan. I know that. No. <laughs> you I went and did other things after graduate school. You may have done it, but at least you didn't tell me ahead of time. Right. <laughs> Next follow up is from Johnny. Or Dear, Joni. I don't know how to actually pronounce it. Maybe now Joni will tell us or Johnny. I think, J- I think it's probably Johnny. Johnny, J O H N Y E. Johnny, who, but she spelled her name completely differently. Um, but Dear, this is that's my guess. Dear virologist friends, for the record, your pediatrician friend in Cambridge is a woman. My first name continues to create some confusion. So our apologies, Johnny. Uh, we didn't know. This and is the person who sent the picture of the uh, the baby in the um, right. uh, MMR vaccine onesie. Secondly, mm-hmm. LLP, the infant in the MMR onesie published in the British Medical Journal, was no more than three weeks old when that picture was taken. She has a very caring paternal uncle to thank for the wise words. As you know, MMR is not routinely given before... 12 months. Hmm. So, um, can you explain that? Well, uh, he I sent think the... probably has to do with uh, correct timing f- uh, to find the window between maternal immunity and uh, the kid's uh, <clears throat> uh, immunity because the maternal immunity can compromise some of these vaccines. Right. So you want to get them after that wanes, but uh, uh, at before they have can be exposed to the disease. But I the, think the that's chi- right. But the child did not receive MMR. Oh no, the child got MMR, but, uh, but apparently pretty really, early. Well, I, I suspect that probably not. That she got the right. T-shirt and that she okay. will. Ah. that's all. Got it. Right. Um, if we're wrong, I'm sure Johnny will. Right. Many thanks to you, your friends, and guests for sharing so generously and reliably your expertise and enthusiasm for micro and cellular biology and especially virology. The season's best of comfort and joy to all your pediatrician friend in Cambridge. P.S. It's minus four centigrade at this moment. <laughs> uh, cool. Hey, Johnny, did you know... Um, um, Oh, my gosh. I I can't remember names anymore. Did you know Julia Child? Okay, you let us know, because she used to Uh, live in Cambridge. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. She also sent a link to this T-shirt, which is a a really cool T-shirt. Yes, Uh, yes. that's right. Johnny also sent that link. This is a great T-shirt. It's got the Baltimore classification. Uh, and, you know, the Baltimore classification has evolved over the years since because there have been new viruses and strategies uh, discovered since he originally uh, proposed the uh, classification. And uh, the uh, description that is given on the T-shirt is right up to date. It's, it's good. I'm, I'm wondering who, who did that. Very good. Right. 
um, I sent the link to David Baltimore the other day. And mm-hmm. I said, you should wear this while you're lecturing about the Baltimore scheme. And he said, great <laughs> idea. And then he said, I guess wearing a T-shirt mean, uh, what did he say, darn, wearing a T-shirt is a form of immortality. <laughs> mm, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think he means being pr- having his scheme printed on a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, that's right. You got it. Very good. All right, Joshua writes, uh, yes, I, th- I put these here because um, if, we didn't, <laughs> if we didn't say them today, it would be too late. Some, right. some of these are really gift ideas. Joshua writes, dear Professor Twiv team, you will probably get many submissions of this, but in case you don't, I wanted to make you aware of the wrap-up project, which donates money raised by selling wrapping paper to the homeless. The wrapping to pa- help the homeless. To help the homeless. <laughs> It's like to help the homeless, yes. Gosh, I'm glad you're listening, Rich. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm right on top of this. The wrapping paper designs are made from images of influenza, the common cold, and pneumonia. Give the viral gift of the year to your loved ones this season. Somehow that's just <laughs> not don't right. don't give the wrapping paper to the homeless because they'd do better <laughs> having something like shelter. Best regards, Joshua. It is currently 28 Fahrenheit and sunny here in Lexington, Massachusetts, and looking forward to hopefully up for 70s and sunny in Florida next week. A college hmm. student, huh? Um, Lexington's not far from Cambridge, right? Right. Uh, that's right. Um, I posted this on Facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, and our, our virology colleague, Michael Bookmeyer, uh, said, Herpes, the gift that lasts forever. Yes. That paper is beautiful. The paper is really nice. nice. It's well done. And Matt Freeman, our friend, also sent a link to the same thing. Wrapping Mm -hmm. paper design made from the EM structure of viruses. Pretty cool, and proceeds do go to, proceeds to go to a good cause. And they are not selling the paper to homeless people. No. (laughs) The proceeds. Okay. Right. So there's a UK link and a US link. Oh, that's good, because I saw the UK link, and I said, I'm not paying pound or euros for this. <laughs> oh, good. Very good. These are beautiful. Really nice. Good mm-hmm. idea. Okay, today we're going to do all email, and let us start with Alan. Okay, Cedric writes, Dear Twivers, I had the opportunity to hear Brian Deere, the journalist involved with exposing the Andrew Wakefield scandal, speak about the MMR controversy. When asked about science writing and educating the public about these issues, he was pessimistic about the possibility of educating an apathetic or uninterested public about issues that are increasingly complex and specialized. If a scientist can't understand research being done in a field other than his own, how can we expect a non-scientist to understand these issues? I thought this view seemed overly despondent, and I would be interested in the Twiv crew's response. Is the public uninterested and apathetic about science, and does the increasing technicality of science preclude educating the public enough to make informed decisions? Thank you for your time and input. And uh, Cedric is uh, currently an undergraduate at Oxford. Okay. Well, I vigorously disagree with Brian Deere on this. <laughs> Yeah, I do too. Uh, I, you know, I think the public actually is quite interested, um, and it's just, uh, and and I also think that uh, science can be communicated to the public without, uh, you know, baffling anybody. I, you know, this stuff in principle is not all that difficult to understand. You know, it's got some vocabulary, but you can, you can get around that. And people, you know, if we post these these pictures that are coming up people are going to be fascinated they like space they like astronomy i got my car towed the other day by a guy who told me he was an astronomy buff are you listening to us because i told him to listen to twib <laughs> he was interested in the in the viruses and stuff i think the public is actually quite interested we just need to communicate it properly yeah i agree whenever you know, you talk to somebody on an airplane or some random person, and you know, I used to be in a genetics department, and so I would say that, and, oh, there's so much interesting about genetics. Or if I tell them I'm a virologist, then you know, they want to know about virology. So I, I agree. I think the public is interested, and we can't be despondent. We have to keep trying. Look at the feedback we get from, and we don't really advertise, you know, we could get many more listeners, but look at the feedback from people who aren't even scientists. I think, mm-hmm. uh, it sh- yeah, it just shows that if you do it right, you can engage them. 
Yeah, it can be done. Um, and I, I think it's important to realize where Brian Deere is coming from. He's an investigative journalist mm -hmm. and, and a really, really good one. And as a species, investigative journalists tend to be kind of pessimistic and dour. Because <laughs> their job is, is investigating people who are up to no good most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> As if, they, if they had an idea that this was worthy of an investigative journalism effort, uh, which is a huge effort, then uh, probably there's something there to find. And, and in his case, he investigated this, uh, this Andrew Wakefield scandal, which goes, I mean, th that is a heck of a rabbit hole. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, somebody's going to come back from that with a pretty pessimistic view of public understanding of science. But it, I think it's, I, I kind of distinguish between the people who form these these hard little cores of denialism, like the anti-vaccine movement or the, the climate change denialists, and, and they, they create their own little counterfactual worlds, and, and it's impossible to convince those people of facts. Mm -hmm. um, but then the overwhelming majority of the general public is actually really interested in science, and they are receptive to having it explained intelligently. And, uh, you know, I, I think there is hope. You're never going to get 100%, but... No, you're never going to get 100%. There's going to be... Gonna be there, there are going to be outliers who, who you just have to say, well, you can't reach everybody. Yep. All right. Um, Rich, can you take Juan's? All righty. Uh, Juan writes, Dear Vincent, Dixon, Alan, Rich, and Kathy, after hearing on TWIV 255 a mention of two recent science, paper, science papers about the antiviral role of RNAi in mammals, I was delighted to find that you chose both papers to be commented in the last TWIV. Indeed, this gives me the opportunity to send a follow-up. I had the chance to attend an EMBO workshop last month in southern France. That's the EMBO, is the European Molecular Biology Organization, where Xu Wei Ding and uh, Olivier Vonnier, Vonnier, Vonnet, how do, you, how do I pronounce Vonnet. that? Vonnet. The two senior authors of these studies explained their findings in front of an audience of mainly plant virologists, generating a vivid debate. As you know, RNAi mechanisms were discovered almost simultaneously in C. elegans, that's a nematode, a worm, and in plants. <clears throat> and since those early works, plant virology has been contributing with a pile of evidence of its antiviral role in plants. Um, um, <laughs> you got a little transposition there. Ensing suppressors, RSSs. Hmm. In virtually all plant viruses studied so far, corroborates this incidentally. Both Ding and Voine were co-authors in the very first papers finding RSS viruses in plants back to 1998. Uh, at any rate, so we heard those people talk. I really enjoyed your discussion of these two studies and the insights you bring up to the surface. For plant virologists, there are many subtleties to discover in the relationship of viruses with animal hosts that makes me wish a more fluent communication between plant virology and animal virology that would be uh, truly enriching for both. As a particular example, the suggestion that insect viruses like Notomura virus could provide a sort of bridge for functional evolution as they are able to infect different hosts might apply as well for plant viruses. In fact, a remarkable proportion of plant viruses are transmitted by insect vectors, and he uh, cites a review. Uh, once again, thanks for sharing your time so generously. And then this last one, really cryptic. Episode, uh, there's some, some, some digital... Issues. Something Dropouts. happened with this email. <laughs> yeah. Episode 256 with your whole crew, O Ent. Yeah. <laughs> Ent. I, which, we, which we think means with your whole crew present or present. something. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We got a title, A Crew of Ents. A Crew of Ents. <laughs> nice. So, and then the, the previous thing, uh, I, I think I sorted out. Um, he, I think, was trying to point out that plant and insect RNA viruses encode. RNA silencing suppressors, uh, right? And so right. I think uh, that word was okay, encode or something that's like it, that. That's right. it. That's good. it. 
So there's a PS there, Rich. Ah, sorry. Yep. Uh, where am I? Uh, PS. Another very nice fragment of the last episode was your thoughts after reading Becca's letter, including the wonderful story of Dixon's Spanish teacher. Just a suggestion for Becca. She can check out a divulgative podcast in Spanish from the public broadcasting service in Spain, uh, Entre Pobetas. It translates something like Between Test Tubes. Uh, the episodes are short, only a few minutes, but they are uploaded quite frequently. Finally, please be reassured by an avid podcast listener during my daily commute that indeed no other science podcast can be compared in entertainment with the Twix series. I strongly endorse Vincent's claim. Outstanding. Okay. Becca. What was my claim? Anyway, Becca was... That, uh, there, that she won't find any better podcast, I think. Uh, or any more entertaining yeah. podcast. Wow, those are good. Those are strong claims. Yeah. Uh, Becca was a high school Spanish teacher. Or is, and she wrote us a letter. Right, right that's, that's right. It just went back. And divulgative, divulgative is strictly an Italian word, at least according to the Wiktionary. Yeah. Okay. What does it mean? Uh... Feminine plural form of divulcativo. <laughs> <laughs> That's useless. It divulges a lot. Divulges. Yeah, it sounds like it to me. Some yeah. divulging. All right, Kathy, you are next. Jim writes. This is a different Jim. Greetings. I love the rant in mTOR. The details are fun. Would it be possible to list the next week's papers in the current week's show's notes? A site where they might be found would also be helpful. Not sure I will do them all, but I could. It could help to rid me of TV. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Not Twiv TV. No, just regular TV, like Game of Thrones or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So Jim, we have a friend in Virginia, who's Jim, but this is a different Jim. I think he's also from Virginia, though. Interestingly. Uh, the rant was about, so we did a paper, this mTOR paper, which was about the immune response in flu, and I, I ranted in the, about the introduction, which made flu seem overly dangerous and all that, and oh, right. you know, I was just complaining about that. Right, the way they, the way they phrased yes. the yes. numbers in it was misleading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah not got, that flu is not dangerous, because it certainly is, but... Yeah, they got the um, There's no need to exaggerate. mortality rate confused with the case fatality ratio and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, can we list next week's papers in the show notes? Uh, I would have to put them in like Tuesday-ish because that's when I get around to the right. papers. Because when I post the notes on Sunday, I definitely don't have the next week's in mind. Um, right. I could do that. I mean, I could always add it after the fact. That wouldn't be bad. We Someone requested this before and I... Yeah. I tweeted it a bit, and then I stopped doing it. I think I forgot. A lot of this stuff happens at the last minute. It kind of puts you under the gun. Yeah, know? sometimes we pick a paper on Thursday, that's for sure. Yeah, Something comes right. in out of the uh, embargo, and there right. you go. All right, I'll try and do whatever I can, Jim. Uh, just go ahead and watch TV, Jim. It's okay. <laughs> no, he wants to learn science instead, <laughs> oh, man. sorry. Read any one of the no numerous books that have been picked that are on the TWIV bookshelf. Yeah, Spillover will keep you busy for a while. Yeah, the, uh, are people aware of the fact that there's actually an Amazon site that has all the TWIV picks? Tell them. There's an Amazon site that actually has all the TWIV picks. You ought to put that in the show notes. If you, I've had trouble finding it uh, now and then. But it's, you know, it's an amazing reading list. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah, and long. Whenever there's a book, I add it to it. It's called the Twiv Bookstore. There's actually a link at twiv.tv on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, but for those of you who don't go to websites, it is astore.amazon.com slash virologyws-20. There you go. Yeah. That's why I have a link. And, and there's enough reading there <laughs> to keep you busy for a lifetime. Yes, the yeah. last one was... Yeah, there's um, a lot of books on this. It's pretty cool. They're over 10 pages worth, and... Pretty soon I'm going to hit the limit. There's a limit to how many I can put there. Really? Oh. Hmm. Well, you're just going to have to call Amazon and tell them no. Call Jeff. Uh, you, you need to make a make an exception in this case. Hey, Jeff. This is yeah. important. Mm -hmm. All right. Will writes, hello. Wait a minute. This says twim team. Oh, now, twim what's team. the story? Is this a twim letter? Let me just see here. 
Hmm. Twim team. Well, he, it went to Twiv, but I th- I'm assuming it is Twim. So I'm going to skip it. It could go to either. But if, it, if, if this is somebody who's specifically a Twim listener, then you should probably answer it over there. Yeah. I just right. Didn't. He's mostly trying to uh, uh, tell us about his radio station program but it's not it doesn't sound like it's anything that we could go listen to it's a live radio show about science okay so we'll skip that one robin writes oh our friend robin hedgehogs are an old world mammal with species found throughout eurasia and africa their import into north america is banned with frequent reference to taxonomic trees twiv should assign a new office of branch manager I nominate Dr. Alan Dove, who would be good at managing the public relations <laughs> implications. <laughs> I am not touching taxonomy with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> <laughs> I love hedgehogs, but haven't seen any since I left the old world, in spite of returning to that area for one plus year in Uijobu, Uijongbu, Uijongbu, and half a year in Bush Daddy's War. Audios are .mp3 and videos are .mp4. Some emailer was going to record an mp3 from a video. You can rip an mp3 from a video, though. You can. It's not very hard to do. Why shouldn't vaccine strains of polio be added to Coke, Pepsi, beer, bottled water, etc.? Will it be will be easier to distribute in the endemic areas? Better than gulping crappy strains from crap? <laughs> no. it's You're not gulping crappy strains from crap. I don't no. know. I don't think you should add it to drinking stuff because that typically sits out at room temperature and the virus will go away. I have heard it's, occasionally, uh, yeah, I was wondering whether you could, uh, it, it's not going to be stable enough, right? Yeah, right. right. I think so. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, there have been ideas floated around now and then about, like, uh, uh, engineering uh, fruits and vegetables sure. to oh, yeah. express capsid proteins from viruses yeah. so that you know in your normal diet you would uh, uh, vaccinate yourself against stuff that's gonna you know yeah. the GMO yeah. people are gonna flip out but uh, <laughs> yeah I've heard of that uh, too, that's an yeah. interesting idea um, yeah. there are actually some papers on it recently too for sure Alan did you have some information on yeah hedgehogs? just um, <laughs> hedgehogs are an old world uh, mammal but I, I it didn't sound right to me because I have seen them um, as pets here in North America, and I quick, quick Google search, I confirmed that they are they are indeed bred in North America as uh, as pets. Um, and that same search brought up a page from the Customs and Border Protection Service um, that seems to indicate that they have some mechanism for importing mm-hmm. them, but they're not running around wild in this country. Okay. All right, we're back to you, Alan. Wait, okay. did what? I read any? Wait. Yeah, you did. You had a short one. Okay. You want to? Sorry, I didn't know the order. Yeah, I forgot. Yes, you're right. I did. I know. I'm sorry. It was short. It wasn't. Write down the order. It wasn't my doing. Yeah. We'll get you a long one. All right, Uh, Alan. Okay, Jackie writes. uh, Good morning, Twiv team. I wanted to thank you for reading my last email on Twiv two fifty six and for your discussions on how modern medicine might affect evolution. You brought up several points that I had not previously considered. You asked when reading the email where Nationwide Children's is located. It's in Columbus, Ohio, and is affiliated with The Ohio State University. And in response to the comment of Go Blue at the end of the episode, I am required to respond, Go Bucks. <laughs> also in this episode, you mentioned two papers on Myrna and whether or not they were antiviral in mammals. I just wanted to remind you that the TWIV team has already discussed antiviral Myrna in a couple of times on TWIV and even picked the discussion with Dr. Coyne at ASV as a story of the year at the end of 2012. This paper slash story from Dr. Coyne's lab was one of the con- was the one concerning primary human trophoblast cells where Myrna within exo- exosomes conferred protection to other cells through induction of autophagy. I believe that there this would meet the parameters set forth on this episode, although I've not yet read the review article you suggested. P.S. It's currently 10 degrees C, with 57% humidity, winds at 7 miles per hour out of the southeast, and completely overcast here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> so that, uh, um, I don't know, other times that we've discussed the um, uh, microRNAs, but the, the coin thing is sort of an, in, I think, you know, when we're talking, when, when people are trying to see whether 
microRNAs are antiviral, they're talking about a direct interaction of right, right. Uh, microRNAs with uh, viral RNA. And the coin story is more of an indirect thing of microRNAs regulating cellular processes and uh, uh, inducing, therefore, a generalized antiviral uh, response. So it's a little different, but however, it is decidedly, evolutionarily, it seems, an antiviral use of uh, microRNAs. Right. I, I love that story of Carol. That's just great. But you're right. The in her case, the merinos and the exosomes are doing something in the cell that makes for an antiviral response, mm -hmm. as opposed to directly degrading the viral genome, which is what those two papers were all about. Mm -hmm. And I love right. that we have listeners who are so tuned into this in detail. It's great. Yes. Yeah. Now Jackie is a insider. She is in yes. the People's Lab. P e e p l e s, not people, right. but peoples, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. It's not. It's not the People's Liberation Lab or something like that. It's the People's. Yeah. Rich, you're next. P i. Meg writes. Hello, I'm an undergraduate student at Colorado State University, who would love to hear about this concept. The video talks about reprogramming CD8 T cells to attack slash kill leukemia cancer cells. How does this work? What is the actual success rate? Could it be used to treat other cancers? Um, so, uh, yes, I looked at this a little bit. So, they are taking, are they taking cells from the patients and engineering them mm -hmm. to uh, express an anti-CD19 B cell uh, antigen and then reintroducing them into the patients to um, uh, basically uh, cure the B cell lymphoma. Right. Kathy, you right. looked up the success rate. Well, so I think, first of all, this particular type of cancer that the patients have is one where they make too many B cells. Those mm -hmm. are the cells uh -huh. that are uh, proliferating uh, anomalously. And so they program these T cells to kill them by making the T cells specifically recognize the B cells which are being made in excess. And so uh, the primary research article describes that there are some side effects but there are some successes and in the text below the YouTube they talk about 12 patients who participated in the trial, 10 adults and 2 children, Nine patients responded, and all are still alive, some after th almost three years. So it's a preliminary clinical trial, I suppose, and I, that's, as far as I know, as much as we know about the success rate. And could it be used to treat other cancers? The answer would be yes, if you can program the T cells to recognize specific antigens that are you know, specific to particular cancers. Of course, this, there's no discriminating between regular B cells and cancer B cells if, in fact, these patients have any normal B cells. So you wipe out all the B cells, so, which is not great if you're going to be infected with something, of course, but right. because they have a, the other, the cancer is a big issue, so you have to deal with that. And interestingly, a lot of the side effects that they report are, in fact, uh, symptomatic of trashing your B cells. So the yeah. therapy mm -hmm. is working. In a way, it's working too well. It's got to be sort of balanced out or, or, or something like that, optimized to uh, work against the cancer. Actually, this is a, you know, this is a whole interesting topic in immunology because when you, when you, in, when you make an immune response, you, uh, your immune cells proliferate, uh, and that ultimately has to be brought under control. Otherwise, you get a lymphoma of some sort every time you uh, had an immune response. So this... Uh, this turning off of the immune response is as important as turning it on. It's a very interesting mm. process. What, what's interesting in this paper is um, one of the patients had a relapse and made B cells that no longer produced the CD19, which mm. is the cell surface protein that the T cells were programmed to detect. Mm. So they, you know, some mutant cells arise that don't make it and they proliferate. Selected escape mutants. Yeah, you go. Yeah. yeah. So that's a problem. Yeah, it's pretty cool. There are a couple of other similar studies that I found. So it's pretty neat, uh, Meg. Yeah, it's a cool approach. All right. Mm, 
who read that? I don't remember. Uh, I read that. So, so Kathy. Kathy comes up with another short one. Short email. Well, you, That's okay. That's all right. You can do two. <laughs> Ricardo writes, hello, Twiv gang. Just another story with Jenny McCarthy. And so he gives a link to a blog post, or no, I guess a New Republic article. I've got whooping cough. Thanks a lot, Jenny McCarthy. And <laughs> so the person describes that they're 30, it's a 31-year-old woman uh, who had been immunized as a child. And although as adults the immunity wanes and you should get, you can get boosted, she evidently didn't. It didn't used to be as much of a problem when there were plenty of children getting immunized and there was lots of good herd immunity. But since there are more and more people not having their children vaccinated against whooping cough, uh, it's more of a problem for everybody. And in this particular article, there's links to a child and an adult coughing and whooping, in case you wondered what that's like, um, and several other uh, interesting things. So we just did a twim on whooping cough vaccine for the telepertussis. And you know, in the U.S., the immunization rates are over 95%, but of course, 5% of our population is quite a lot. So we had 42,000 cases in 2012. And it turns out that at least some of those are from... So the, the, the vaccine does not... There's an acellular pertussis vaccine that is made of pure proteins. And this is something recent. We used to use a whole cell inactivated vaccine. And there has been some concern that the acellular vaccine has some issues that allow infection. It turns out in a baboon model for pertussis infection where the baboons get infected and they develop clinical symptoms similar to those in people. The acellular vaccine prevents disease, but it does not prevent colonization with the bacteria and does not prevent transmission. So you can still have transmission of the bacterium in a, in a population that's been immunized with the acellular vaccine. And if you have anyone who hasn't been vaccinated, then they will get sick. Right. And I've, so there, there's there have been a slew of papers about uh, the acellular vaccine, uh, what it's what it's doing and what it's not doing, and and some of the resurgence in whooping cough in recent years is probably because we switched vaccines. Right. Um, right. Because the the previous vaccine, the the DPT diphtheria pertussis tetanus um, shot, um, was a completely different vaccine concept. Um, where you had whole killed cells in it, and and that vaccine unfortunately had produced frequently produced uh, strong side effects for people, and you know a lot of people weren't able to even get the full sequence of it because they reacted so badly to the first shot. Um, so that this is this was a step that was done. The acellular vaccine was a step to make a cleaner, safer vaccine, which it is, but it may also be less effective. Yeah. The problem is, of course, if everyone were immunized with it, there wouldn't yes. be any disease. But you never get everyone, so it is it is effective when everybody's immunized, and if the immunity wanes, then you can just get vaccinated again with it. Um, and I think it's still. Um, I know when I got mine, it was a combined um, tetanus pertussis. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, good idea to get a tetanus shot periodically anyway, and you might as well get your pertussis at the same time. Um, but again, if if you've got five percent of a population of what are we three hundred and eighty some odd million people, that's, yep, that's a lot, a lot of susceptibles. So interestingly, one of the proteins in the acellular vaccine, I think it's called protactin. Let me just look that up. Uh, so the CDC protactin. Apparently, uh, when they when the CDC isolates bacteria from people in the U.S. who are getting pertussis, they are pertactin-deficient strains. Yes. So it's a throwback to the leukemia story that we just talked about. We're selecting for bacteria that don't have the protein, which is one of the components of the vaccine. Wow. Which you didn't see with the previous That's vaccine because right. you can't, the bacterium can't <laughs> stop making all its proteins That's and right. you were being injected yeah. with all of its proteins. Interesting stuff. Just one other, other thing about the vaccine. Uh, the Tdap is the one that I've gotten most recently, and so that's tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Right. So yeah. you get all three. 
And the A is the acellular, right? Tdap. Right. Ah, uh, yes, I guess so. Yeah. Kathy, you want to do the next one? Uh, that's Lindsay. Yeah. Lindsay writes, Dear Twiv Crew, as a longtime listener, I have always wanted to write in and share my appreciation and compliments for the Twiv podcast. I have spent countless hours listening and learning while in the culture hood and setting up PCR reactions. Thank you for all that you do to bring science and technology together. I'm also writing to share a new science podcast that a couple of other graduate students and I have started called the Petri Dish Podcast. We wanted a way to become more informed and up to date with major topics in science while providing information in a fun way for anyone with an interest in science. We hope to encourage listeners to ask more questions and initiate conversations of their own. We recently released our first episodes of the Petri Dish podcast on iTunes and are excited to share with a larger audience. We've received some positive feedback but are looking for ways to become more visible and continue improving. We would welcome thoughts and any insights you and your team could offer to new podcasters. Please let us know what you think. Lastly, if possible, and to get the famous Twiv bump, we are hoping you might consider our podcast as a listener pick of the week. Regardless, any advice or feedback would be most welcomed and greatly appreciated. Lindsay and fellow Petri Dish hosts, Rachel and Sabria. And so they've got links to the website, the Facebook page, Twitter, email, and iTunes link. And I didn't have time to check any of those. So I can't comment yet. Sorry. Yeah, well, we'll have uh, we'll have all these links in the show notes. I think it's cool that um, you're doing this. Um, however, you are grad students, right? So you're going to be a little squeezed there for time. So good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, one of one of your uh, stock recommendations, Vincent, that I think is right on the money for a podcast is to be regular. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. if you're occasional, then it's hard to get a. Uh, a, a real following. Yeah, you have to pick a, a schedule that works for you guys and um, stick to it. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to lose people. Now, I, yeah, I, my student um, Ashley started a podcast with a fellow graduate student. Uh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, I think it was called Biochemistry Revealed. It was really good. They had a great dynamic. They recorded in the Twiv Studio, so it sounded great. <laughs> but they weren't regular. They didn't get a lot of listeners, and eventually they stopped. So I think that's a really important thing to try and do. It's hard, though, as a student, right? I just knew they were going to have trouble, which yeah, is too I bad. Think, Sorry. I think grad school grad school, and even postdoctoral years are not the time, the, the best time to do so. I mean, I, I applaud the effort, and, you know, great that they're, they're trying to put this show together and do this sort of outreach effort, but uh, the amount of time it, that it takes to put together a podcast and do it on a regular basis, um, I can't imagine having done something like this in grad school for more than more, more than a few weeks. It's funny, I just got a, a separate email from a couple of grad students at Harvard who are starting an immunology podcast, So, and again, they, they gave us ins- credit for inspiration, so I think that's great. Yeah, I just think you have to be realistic, and you know, if you do end up stopping, don't be sad. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's a good. Mm-hmm. good and you advice. can, I mean, you can even format the show. You can do maybe short episodes. Um, mm-hmm. We do a ninety-minute podcast, but if we were doing little ten-minute snippets on different topics, it would take a whole lot less time to record and um, a bit less time to research too. So I did visit and listen, and um, um, I had some problems playing the podcast. I'm not sure why. Um, and also, um, your sound is a little echoey. Yeah. And I think one of the things you have to be really uh, careful about is have really good sound, because it is, after all, a podcast. There's no video for people to fall back on. So people will focus on your sound, and it has to be really good. And I learned that from listening to podcasts and, um, you know, tried to do that from the start. So that's one of my bits of advice for you. But I encourage our listeners to check them out. How do you get around the echoey? Well, I don't know how they're miking themselves, but often um, if they're sitting too close to each other and they're individually miked, then you'll get echo. Mm -hmm. Or if you only have one mic sitting on the table in a room with a few people sitting around it, you'll get echo. Get headsets. So headsets would be good. Yeah, those, the cheapest 
way to upgrade the sound, I think, is, is headsets. Yeah, so a headset will, will isolate them. And you have to sit at least three feet apart if you're going to be yeah. in the same room. We're lucky here on TWIV. We're rarely, but... <laughs> we're, we're miles apart here. <laughs> when, I, when I go to a, a place and, and record a TWIV and we're sitting next to each other, there's always bleed into each other's mics, and I have to edit all that out, otherwise it sounds echoey. And that's a lot of work, I, I must yeah. say. <laughs> so anyway, good luck with that, guys. That's pretty cool. All right, I am next. Joshua writes, Dear Twiv team, first-time emailer, long-time listener since around episode number 15. Thought this might be of interest. He sends a link to an article in the uh, MIT News called Better Batteries Through Biology. And this is all about making batteries with uh, bacteriophage proteins, um, with bacteriophage particles which we have actually discussed uh, on TWIV, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this a while ago. Yeah, they've been pics or, or something, but yeah. we have discussed it quite a while ago. Yeah, Angela Belcher is a professor at MIT who does this. She makes the uh, arrays from uh, like filamentous uh, bacteriophage proteins, and they can act as very, very low-power batteries. It's pretty cool. Um. P.S. I know it has been a while since it aired, but I wanted to mention that TWIV number 146 certainly was a joy to listen to as I work at MIT Lincoln Laboratory and had no idea that we had a group working on such things, considering the lab was started in the 50s to develop advanced electronics for air defense. It has certainly branched out. And that was Draco's Potion, right? That was uh, the idea of making a targeting antiviral, I believe. Mm -hmm. TWIV 146. All right, we are back to Alan Dove. Okay, Jim writes. Now, is this uh, Jim? This is Jim. This, this is, is Jim. 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 Right, okay. <laughs> uh, gentle souls. Oh, I, I, I like that. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Radio Lab. I know. I know. <laughs> did this uh, thirty-minute presentation about rabies and the use of induced comas to save lives. He provides a link. I've been bothered by the fact that rabies is transmitted via saliva, but tra travels along the nerves to the brain. I thought the neuronal pathway protected the virus from any immune response. If the virus is in the saliva, a response should occur, and presumably both the immune reaction and protected path usually occur at the same time. However, the antibodies cannot pass the blood-brain barrier to block the virus when it arrives there. Is this right? If so, then is it correct to assume that comas are not a factor in saving a life by slowing down uh, brain activity until antibodies build up sufficient numbers to neutralize the virus. I mentioned Dixon in the subject line because another podcast, AAA Science Magazine, and he gives a link, includes comments about Plasmodium vivax malaria becoming more important as progress is made at removing P. falciparum from the environment. Um, links to a topic summary, full transcript requires membership. The discussion also mentions that at one time the Nobel Prize was awarded for the use of P. falciparum to cure syphilis, much the way comas have been applied to rabies cases. I wonder what the protesters of bad science or bad research would make of such an exa of each example. Hmm. That uh, uh, curing syphilis with uh, P. falciparum, that was uh, discussed in that book's uh, spillover, and apparently it was... Uh, effective. It induced a fever, mm -hmm. I think. Um, that, yeah, of course, it induced a, a fever, and the um, syphilis bacterium is uh, temperature sensitive. So it was, it was not, it was not ineffective. Of course, you're trading one problem for another, but yeah, not a good strategy, I think. So I asked Matthias Schnell, who is a rabies virologist uh, in Philadelphia. And he answered, first, I do not want to get much into rabies virus treatment, the so-called Milwaukee Protocol, except that it is highly controversial. In my opinion, there is no treatment for rabies after onset of rabies symptoms. In rare circumstances, people do survive rabies, but the chances are very, very low. Yeah, so we shouldn't give the idea that this is a protocol that is, <laughs> you know, routine. This is, something, this is something that's been done a couple of times. Yes. And it's, it's still in the realm resort. of panic. Yes, panic last dope, resort, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> now to the question. Yes, it's true. Rabies stays under the radar of the immune system and reaches the brain via motor neurons, and it is not detected by the immune response of the host. 
The brain is an immune privileged site, so with any signals that something is going wrong, no immune cells enter, so no immune response. So that is the problem. The listeners now want to know if rabies vi vaccine or virus is immunogenic when it reaches the salivary glands. Probably yes. However, that is already too late. It's the last step in the life cycle of the virus. In addition, people in the later stages of the disease do have sometimes good amounts of antibodies against rabies virus. Again, too late. The damage to the CNS is done. This is the problem with rabies virus. When symptoms occur, there is already a lot of the brain infected. In addition, it has been tried to vaccinate people after symptoms of rabies occurred, but without any success to save them. Now some research groups analyze if you need a certain kind of antibody, IgG1 versus IgG2. Again, the problem remains that when you have symptoms of rabies, the virus did already the damage. So after a potential exposure, get your, rabies, get your vaccine and you will be fine. It's 100% effective. Hope that helps. I think so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would just comment um, when when he says the brain is immunologically privileged. Uh, that does not mean it was. It, it used to be believed that there was no immune system access to the brain at all, which we now know is not true. Um, but what's going on here is that there's not effective access of, say, antibodies in the bloodstream to uh, the site of infection in the brain. But there is an innate response in the CNS, right? There's an innate response in the CNS. In fact, there's a whole lot of immunology going on in the CNS. Uh, there's a whole little subfield of neuroimmunology um, yeah. that that has found all these amazing things and you know, glial cells are doing macrophage-like stuff, and, and there's a lot of communication back and forth. It's just we are not to the point where we have figured out how to harness that to stop something like a rabies virus infection. Right, and there's also T-cell surveillance. Right. So, uh, Britta Engel, Engelberg, Engelhart, Engel, uh, I can give you a link. Anyway, writes a lot of reviews, and she has one that's this castle moat hypothesis uh, model and describing how the T-cells kind of go out and, and warn the rest of the castle when something's happening. So um, the, the moat being kind of like the blood-brain barrier. Kathy, uh, you're a blood-brain barrier aficionado. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, when I first heard about this, I'm thinking about our uh, listeners who may not be into this. You know, I used to visualize like some sort of filter that was sitting at the base of my head, okay, <laughs> that was right. filtering out stuff that might otherwise go to my brain, which, of course, is uh, completely wrong. Could you sort of, you know, give a, a layman's description of the blood-brain barrier? Sure. And Sorry in fact, to put you on the spot there, no, but I no, thought... There's, there's a really good image that I'll have to pull into, but it's not even in my office at the moment, where if you think of the... There's a picture that's the brain uh, circulatory system, so just all the blood vessels, okay? And it, it outlines the shape of the brain. Uh, it looks like a brain, but it doesn't have all the interstitial stuff where the neurons and everything else are. And the blood-brain barrier is throughout the entire brain because the blood-brain barrier is between the, the walls of the blood vessels and the rest of the brain, where the neurons and the rest of the brain parenchyma are. So there are things that can cross the blood vessels if they're less than 500 Daltons in size or if there are specific transporters for them, they can uh, cross. But predominantly, the blood-brain barrier keeps things from crossing and it's made up of the endothelial cells that line all the blood vessels. And they form these really tight junctions that are different from tight junctions elsewhere in the body because they have contributions from additional cell types, astrocytes, additional basement membranes, and so forth. And then there's even the possibility of uh, some immune cells passing right through a cell. It's, it's transcytosis. So they're not passing between cells. They're just like passing through the cells. It's the most amazing concept. Sure. Um, and so those can be T cells uh, and the whole... Trojan horse hypothesis for some viruses comes about that, you know, if they're infecting some kind of cell that either could transit right through the cell or between cells, that the, that's one way to get across the blood-brain barrier. 
And presumably, evolutionarily, this is a device to protect the brain from environmental insults. Is that correct? Right. Of course, this is right. a why a why issue. So yes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, because in a way, it comes at cells, a price. Right, but the brain cells, you know, typically don't regenerate, and so right. if you lose them, it's all is lost. You take your chances. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Rich, you're next. Uh, uh, okay, so Colin writes, Dear Dr. Racaniello and friends, if you ever have a scientist slash pollster on the show, would you mind asking them a few questions? <laughs> Not super pressing, but if there's an awkward lull and you need to fill the void, I'd be grateful. Wait, wait a minute. We never have <laughs> awkward lulls, do we? <laughs> no. It's always somebody willing to jump into the jump into the breach yeah here's what i'd love to know percent of people who believe viruses are bacteria <laughs> percent of people who believe antibacterials can treat viral infections percent of people who believe antivirals can treat bacterial infections i have plenty of poll results uh i have plenty of poll results that talk about quote percent believing that antibiotics can treat viral infections end quote and the above data w uh, would all the different hmm. would be all the different misconceptions would be all the different misconceptions to be factored uh, separately, i.e., there is confusion over definition of antibiotics as well as confusion over taxonomy of viruses. Uh, I have asked approximately twenty people and Pew if they have data on the above, and nobody does. You are my last hope. <laughs> wow! Wow! I don't know of anyone who has done this. I don't know how you would do it because if we did it, it would be irrelevant because all well, you know, most yeah, of our listeners right. probably know this. Right. Yeah, yeah. Polling. Polling is a whole science. Yes. Um, you have to select the one of the hardest parts is selecting your sample and making sure you get a representative distribution and how many people do you need to include in that distribution and then you got contact them and most of them don't answer and yada 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 um, I don't know some organization like ASM or ASV might be able to do that but um, my concern is that the results might just be too depressing and then where are you gonna go yeah my guess is that a very very large percentage of the population I'll, I'll, I'll guess over 80 percent maybe over 90 percent don't really know what cells are, mm. don't really know what bacteria are, don't really know what viruses are, kind of don't know how the whole thing works. You know? yeah. Yeah. I think the next time a census is done in the U.S., they should include these three questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them as uh, introductory uh, clicker questions in my virology class. I'm going to set it up. Yeah, but they'll, ah. they'll get, your students message. will get them right now. Well, we'll see. Well, let us you know. know. I can do the we same thing, have, too. Yeah. I'm going to do some clickers this year, yeah, so yeah. I'll try it. Yeah. All right, Kathy, you're next. Okay. Tim writes, just listening to TWIV 258 while working alone in the lab at night, Vincent was wondering about the typhoon in the Philippines, known as Super Typhoon Haiyan. I submit my listener pick of the week for some perspective on this monster of a storm. It's a post from Phil Plate's Bad Astronomy blog showing two pictures of the storm from space, one from 700 kilometers, 430 miles up, and another from 36,000 kilometers, 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. A perfect example of how nature can be simultaneously beautiful and terrifying. Something I don't have to tell a bunch of virologists. <laughs> and he sends uh, the link to this uh, blog. Mm. So, yeah. The, uh, the high-level one, 36,000 kilometers, is really pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's sort of what Sandy looked like from space. I remember some pictures of Sandy. The thing was huge. Oh. Are you still? Yeah. Um, what's, why is Google... Hang on, asking me if I'm still here. We're here. Yeah, please, Rich, <laughs> tell your son. I'll, I'll tell Jeremy to get right on it. Uh, next one is from Johnny, our friend from Cambridge. Uh, our female friend from Cambridge. Yes. Uh, news from Massachusetts. It's an article about uh, a new strain of influenza. Scientists at the Hinton State Laboratory have identified a new strain of influenza, which was one of the four strains included in the development of the 
influenza vaccine. The Hinton Lab is the first state laboratory in the nation to successfully identify a new strain for the CDC, which named the strain Influenza B slash Massachusetts slash 2 slash 2012 like virus in recognition of the finding. And uh, goes on to talk about how the strains are identified each year. So this year, yeah, a new strain of B influenza was included in the vaccine. Not sure it's a good thing to have it named after your state, but so be it, right? <laughs> Some places don't like that, like... Um, <clears throat> Norwalk? Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, you know, the Four Corners virus is what I was thinking about, Yeah, where the, it was originally called Four Corners, and they said, no, you can't call it Four Corners. We depend on yeah. tourism. Right. So it's, cool. it's cool to have your uh, lab make that contribution, though. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts is a pretty open-minded state. Is that why you're there? No, I'm here because of my wife's job, but... <laughs> um, Kathy, you're next. No, am I... No, Alan uh, is next, sorry. I think I'm really, I might be next. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I wrote it down, so now I know. Uh, okay. uh, Kathy, I did, and I still get confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, more positive... Uh, John writes, more positive survival data out of Amgen's phase three with oncolytic herpes virus uh, and sends a um, uh, link to a press release from Amgen... Um, about their survival data of this oncolytic virus that they're working on trials about. So, cool. It's an engineered herpes virus that is uh, injected intratumorally. Right. And there's a, a wiki link here that describes it actually in some detail because I was interested in, you know, the extent to which it's uh, engineered and the wiki site does pretty good on it. But I'll tell you, whoever named this thing Talmagene uh, Lariparepvec. Oh, my gosh. That's not going to sell really well, I don't think. You know? Well, I, yeah, you're not going to be selling this in, uh, in direct-to-consumer ads, I don't think. No. Ask your doctor about <laughs> Talmagene Lariparepvec. <laughs> this is well, a phase three. Often simply called TVEC. They'll give it some cute little name. Yeah, yeah. So it's a phase three. Yeah. And they've had some... Some success, I guess, by some measures. Yeah. yeah. This um, oncolytic therapy is really, it's a big really deal. a big deal. I'm amazed. Yeah. It's really incredible. All right, Rich. Uh, Liam, Liam writes, Hey, Twiftcasters, I just listened to your caveat mTOR episode. I feel like there's a joke in the title I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, to tell you the truth, Liam, I actually had to look it up to make, I, you know, the phrase caveat emptor was familiar to me. What, what is that, uh, Alan? Let the buyer, buyer beware. Let, let the, the buyer, buyer beware. beware. Yeah. Uh, and I thought you might be interested to know that mTOR is also hugely, a hugely important molecule in neuroscience. It is downstream of BDNF signaling, which has been implicated in pretty much every psychiatric and neurodegenerative disorder. A quick Google scholaring didn't turn up any role of BDNF in peripheral immunology, so maybe the immune privileged nature of the brain allows mTOR to have this dual role. Either way, <clears throat> it's interesting that mTOR would have such different effects centrally and peripherally or I guess it could be having overlapping but uncharacterized functions in both places. This seems a good, like a good opportunity to suggest a somewhat self-serving uh, pick for a listener, pick of the week. You may remember that a while ago I emailed you asking for podcasting advice. I'm happy to report that my TWIV-inspired neuroscience podcast, On Your Mind, is now up and running. So if any of your listeners, or any of you for that matter, would like to learn more about neuroscience or life as a graduate student, I would encourage you to check us out. And he gives a link to his podcast. Thanks for the help and inspiration. Liam. Uh, you know, Signaling pathways, especially one as apparently as central as mTOR, uh, there's a tremendous amount of overlap in terms of what turns them on and what they do downstream. And I think sorting all this out uh, is going to take decades. Yep. I, mean, yeah. I think there's a lot we don't know there. But yeah. mTOR is a master regulatory molecule. It certainly is, yes. There's a lot of stuff. And any time with BDNF, um, I mean, yeah, it seems to be involved in everything in the brain. And any time you have something that's, that 
is involved in that many different things, what it usually means is that you've found some central theme in mm. regulation, and we just don't know the other components of it. Right. So I've always felt the best thing that I could do in science would be to train other scientists who do really well. So now here we are in TWIV, we are inspiring other people to podcast. This is the third one, mm -hmm. right? I just think that's great. Uh, and this, uh, it's, this is a, uh, you know, a uh, chain reaction because part of our motivation here is to communicate science to the public, right? Yeah, and the more yeah. people podcasting science, uh, the better we do at that. That's great. I like the name of their podcast, On Your Mind. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that, Leem. Yeah, I didn't have a chance to listen to any of these, so I don't know. Mm -mm. I would give you a suggestion, Leem, okay? When you go to your website... You cannot play the podcast from the front page of the website. You have to mm -hmm. click again to yep. get into each episode. You need to put the player on the front page. Now, right. you may think, yeah. well, come on, one click, but I'm telling you, one click can be the difference. That'll do it. I noticed that. All yeah. right. Uh, Kathy, you're next. Maria writes, Dear Vincent and friends, I really like your podcast. Thank you for your fantastic work and teaching us so much over the years. Keep up with the good work. I work in influenza A virus assembly mechanisms in Instituto Gubinquian de Ciencia in Portugal, which Listen is a fantastic that. Just place. Roll off her tongue. Has you been practicing <laughs> that? Research. Well, I've forgotten all the Portuguese I learned in <laughs> August. So, but anyway, the institute accommodates a strong but quite broad research community, being a perfect place to establish multidisciplinary projects and collaborations. In this sense, I was talking to a friend, a colleague at work, about one of my favorite aspects of viral assembly, which is the ability of this virus to adopt different forms, filamentous and spherical, determined by several viral proteins, being the most prominent, M1 and M2. To refer to this characteristic, I told her that the virus is pleomorphic, uh, and then she spells it two different ways, uh, which is what we uh, read in papers. And to the best of my knowledge, we don't use polymorphic. She asked me why we called this feature a pleomorphism rather than a polymorphism, and I couldn't provide a satisfactory answer. Any virus is pleomorphic because it has different shapes during its life cycle, virion versus inside a cell, maybe even when budding. But in this context, we actually mean the different form strains may adopt as a virion. So I have decided to ask your opinion regarding this matter and hope you can actually inform us as to why we favor the usage of pleomorphic rather than polymorphic. Thanks a lot. Yours sincerely, M. Joa. Uh, and I had stuck some definitions okay. in there just for your information. Uh, yeah, the okay. definitions are really good. Go ahead, Vincent. I thought Alan would do this. Um, yeah, I hadn't gotten to, okay. <laughs> to the etymology <laughs> of this yet. But. So, pleo, the definition of pleo is a form having more than the usual or expected number, right? And poly just means... Many. I really like that distinction. First of all, I have no idea why we say pleomorphic rather than polymorphic. It's just I just learned it that way. Yep. And I use, in terms of virion structure, uh, I think of pleomorphic as having mostly to do with membrane viruses that, you know, give you this. They look in the electron microscope, at least most of them, like just kind of bags of stuff and have multiple shapes. I really like this distinction uh, in pleo of having more than the more than the expected number okay mm -hmm. that's an interesting distinction from just polymorphic where uh, the implication is that there are a certain number of expected uh, uh, structures and pleo um, uh, you know implies that oh I didn't expect that yeah mm -hmm. so that's good and with respect to genetics, uh, you know, a pleiotropic is when a, a gene has multiple effects on the phenotype yeah. right. when you mutate it. So it's the same root there. But of course, right. that, in that genetics, gives... we talk about polymorphisms. Right. Right. True. Right. But it, again, the, the definition seems to be multiple seemingly unrelated phenotypic traits. Yeah. So you wouldn't necessarily think that affecting uh, the height of a person would also affect how their enzymes digest such and such or you know something like that so th yeah, that's yeah. where the pleiotropy may be yeah this uh, discussion of the entomology I was thinking the same thing Kathy the because uh, I use pleiotropic all the time 
uh, thinking about uh, in a genetic context and the notion that a mutation is causing unanticipated downstream effects that's pleiotropism and it's a very important concept and and there again the notion that it's unexpected is an important part of that the use of that word you know i think in terms of virion morphology i think years and years ago someone used pleomorphic and it stuck yeah I and, think that's right. And I'm not sure there was any reason other than the first person, you know, just used the word. The first person may have known what it meant, but I certainly didn't know what it meant. <laughs> yeah. You know, usage can fix something, right, in the language. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. can take the word transfection, right, which Oof. originally had one meaning and then a different meaning has been fixed and there's nothing you could do it about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the answer is we use these terms because we use these terms. That's right. right. It's not a good answer, but... But it's the truth. It's the truth. John writes, first, why did Alan fail to point out that you reached a great milestone in binary, two to the eighth episodes? Yeah, <laughs> Alan, Alan. Alan didn't think of it. <laughs> I actually did, and, and I meant to say something, and oh. I forgot. I apologize. Nice. We could have yeah. used that in the title, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Second, what was the title of 256? It wasn't Twiv 2 to the 8th. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a long I'm not sure it's on the front page. Maybe someone can find it. Second, since this is a virology podcast rather than zoology, it is important to explicitly mention a limitation on Gould's theory of evolution. Gould restricts some of his statements to sexually reproducing metazoa. Obligate sexual reproduction forces a huge amount of gene mixing, which makes speciation almost impossible. To overcome the inertia of the established genome requires an extraordinary fitness advantage or a severe drop in population size by population reduction or reproductive isolation. So we see punctated equilibrium. Some animals reproduce asexually and have no mixing. They need not follow the same pattern. Prokaryotes and viruses are somewhere in the middle. They normally create clones, exact copies except for errors, but they can exchange genes with closely or distantly related species. They could follow a third pattern of evolution, not the same as sexually or asexually reproducing animals. Perhaps they are closer to plants. If you want to nitpick, retroviruses enable horizontal gene transfer in animals, but this does not seem to be a common cause of speciation. Interesting reading on mathematical models of evolution, but probably inapplicable to viruses, and he cites a book by Martin Nowak, Evolutionary Dynamics, Exploring the Equations of Life. This stuff makes my head hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's, the, notion uh, that se the notion that sexual reproduction um, all, uh, uh, all effectively drives punctuated equilibrium is... That's new to me, and that's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what, what, what brought this up. Does anyone know? Was that 256 uh, that we were talking about? Evolution? Might have been, which was titled How Mice Say Notavirus. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's the uh, RNAi episode. We yeah. get into evolution now and then. I'm probably sure. way over our heads. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure this, this concept has come up um, of punctuated equilibrium. And, uh, and yeah, I... Gould, Gould was a paleontologist, and he studied fossil organisms, which are generally sexually reproducing animals. Um, I, I would expect it would be the same for plants, at least sexually reproducing plants, because plants do have sex. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They, they cross-pollinate. Um, but I don't know, I, I was not aware of this, uh, this restriction on, that, on punctuated equilibrium. It, it kind of makes sense, though. Uh -huh. I think John is a mathematician, or he might be our listener who's in retirement who went back and got a degree in applied mathematics. Yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I remember. Be. Yeah, yeah. Even the connections. I don't know. Just yeah. All right, Alan, you're next. Okay, Temel writes. Can someone clarify to me why, in vaccine potency testing, uh, challenge dose of 10,000 ID50 is used. Why not 100 ID50 or 1,000 ID50 or uh, 1 million ID50? What determines this challenge dose for the vaccine to be passed to the public use after manufacture? Got me. Got me. I didn't know. And I, don't, I don't even know if that's a, a standard 
thing. I don't think it could. I mean, how could I, it be? It doesn't it would, make sense to me that that would be a yeah, standard thing. I'm sure it would be different according to the virus and the model mm-hmm. that you're using, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I would think so, too. I mean, you may, Tamil, you may have read a study where they use that, but it may have been specific to that study. You know, yeah. usually people, usually when people are doing this kind of stuff, they titrate virus into whatever the model they are and, uh, you know, choose uh, a dose that's appropriate for their for their studies. So I would expect that these would be, you know, depending, as Vincent said, depending on the system, it would come out different. But well, sometimes don't, if you're using an animal, wouldn't you use a couple of different challenge doses uh, as well? Yeah. I think that we have done, we have done some papers, I'm pretty sure, where they have done that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they, the goal in a challenge test is to be sure that you infected the test animals. Um, so you'd use whatever dose is going to guarantee that you'd get an infection if the vaccine yeah. wasn't working. You want a certain rate of infection to get some yeah. good data on your vaccine. Well, one the most recent paper I can think of is the um, CMV vectored SIV vaccine in uh, monkeys that, we, that came out of Oregon. Right. You can take a look at that and see how many ID50s they used for their challenge. Well, and I just Googled for some subset of those words and... Um, Standard dose for the I2 Newcastle disease vaccine is 10 to the 6th. Well, it's not LD50s, but it's egg infectious dose 50s. Yeah. So, you know, I th- again, I, th- I think it's going to depend. I'm, I'm not sure it's always 10,000. Okay. Uh, Rich, you're next. Uh, Needy writes, Hi, I listened to your video on this topic, and it really in intrigued to look into this topic some more, intrigued me to look into this topic some more. And I have a question which has been bothering me for some time. So I don't know what video she's talking about. How does sea gas differentiate between self-DNA and foreign DNA? And if we can, then how and why can we use it against autoimmune diseases? Your thoughts on this are highly appreciated. I guess it's our sea gas episode, right? Right. Hmm. So, Vincent, you have an answer for this that I like. I, I think that it's all about where the DNA is. So, sea gas is a cytoplasmic sensor. Um, the cell has DNA in the nucleus, as far as I know. So, mm-hmm. if there's DNA in the cytoplasm, that's not good. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. There's nothing else in that paper. I don't think that indicates um, any other uh, way to uh, differentiate. Though, actually, as I recall. Um, there are other sensors that uh, see certain uh, base compositions or short sequences because they, uh, if I remember correctly, they used as a stimulator of the response uh, DNA sequences that did not contain uh, those particular uh, sequences. So I think there are uh, some sequences that are probably more prevalent in viral ge- uh, mm. genomes than cellular genomes. Are you thinking of C- allow- uh, CPG, for example? Yeah, something like that. That can yeah. allow some of these uh, uh, DNA sensing systems to discriminate between uh, foreign and uh, self-DNA. Now, there are also nuclear sensors of DNA. In, in fact, mm-hmm. that was pointed out to us after we talked about that episode. We we really should do some of those papers, but um, that's the they are there. The question would be: <laughs> Now we're in yeah. the nucleus where DNA is supposed to be there. How does it discriminate? Right. right. Mm-hmm. And not having read those, I don't know. There's all sorts of possibilities because there's, for example, in nuclear DNA, there's a lot of methylation and right. yeah. Uh, yeah. and other things going on that may not be uh, present in viral DNA. So there are opportunities there to discriminate between self and foreign. Yeah. So that was uh, TWIV-222, and then the follow-up was in 223 about the C-gas. Right. Okay. Good. Kathy, I believe you're next. Coke writes, Dear Vincent et al., Hello, I'm a graduate student in RU. I don't know what RU is. But I think it's Rockefeller. Ah, okay. Uh. <clears throat> I sometimes pick up past TWIV randomly and listen to them. I was surprised to hear that there are very high-resolution cryo-EM structures of virus. This time, I am writing with a small question. You know recently there are many high-resolution cryo-EM structures of virus, say, 
3.5 angstrom structure of dengue virus or 3.2 angstrom structure of aqua rio virus. Then I've just come up with an idea. If I could transform a membrane protein which originates from other species, say GPCR from human, so that would be a G protein coupled receptor from yeah. human, to the surface of the virus membrane, and if that transformed virus is stable, we could try cryo-EM with that transformed virus and get the structure. Then we could also get the structure of the transformed protein. You know it's very difficult to overexpress, purify, and crystallize membrane proteins, but in this way, this difficulty could be overcome. This is just an idea, and I would greatly appreciate if you guys can give me some comments. Thank you for always giving me interesting talks. Best regards, Coke. Yeah, if the virus is infectious, right? If you put a foreign protein in, it might not be. That's one of the limitations I could imagine. Uh, well, I mean, basically, all you're trying to do is make a, a, a pseudotype virus, right? It doesn't even have to be infectious. If you could, yeah. if you could uh, get it, uh, anything to to bud uh, with the expressing the the protein and get it on the surface. I thought, you know, I think that there's probably all kinds of engineering problems here, but as a general concept, I thought this was brilliant. Yeah, it's like, it's one of those things that seems so obvious that it should have been done, right? Yeah, yeah. My, my guess is that there, there are lots of constraints in getting something to organize appropriately in, into a uh, viral membrane. But, you know, if you needed to get a structure of a of a head or something like that. Maybe you could make some sort of uh, chimeric protein that would be uh, expressed. Uh, it, it, and uh, I have to say that uh, talking to my uh, virus, I got some virus structure friends around here, and they're really in, uh, uh, enthusiastic about the use of cryo-EM to get structures of viruses, they're thinking that down the road it's just going to repra replace crystallography. It's gotten so good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's quick. Uh, and you don't need crystals. Right. right? You right. can do it from, from individual particles. So I think this is a really interesting idea. Has anyone made a virus ex with a, a, an envelope virus with a foreign protein in the membrane? I do not know. Hmm. So there you go. Any crystallographers out there, let us know what you think about this. Yeah, this this strikes me as a really, really cool idea. Yep. And as you said, it's it's something that it sounds so elegant and, and straightforward that somebody ought to have tried it, but that doesn't mean that any, anybody yeah. has. Right. Um, and uh, and yeah, I can, I can imagine a number of ways that it would go wrong, but I don't know. Might be worth a I, shot. It just sounds like a great idea to me. Yeah. By the way, uh, Rich, you said cryo EM is quick. Well, depends how big the virus is. I at this big DNA yeah. virus meeting, there's a uh, guy uh, from uh, his name is River. Um, he's from University of Texas El Paso, and he's been getting the structure of one of these big guys, and it's taken him years. Yeah, I, of I've course, the Texan is working on big viruses. <laughs> cryo EM. <laughs> he he has actually. I should put a link to this. He has a movie that he made of it. It's a giant virus of the protist cafeteria Rowan Bergensis, okay, which is a marine protist. And he said there are so many atoms in the particle when he tries to make an animation, every frame of the movie takes four hours to render. <laughs> so I'm going to put a link to this movie on the website because he put a short clip of this uh, on his website. It's really beautiful. So Will it crash our computers to try and look at no, it? No, it's, it's fine <laughs> on the computer. But to generate, because wow. there are millions and millions and millions of, of uh, atoms there. It's pretty cool. All right, the last one for today is from Sean, who writes, TWIV, I had a question pertaining to Dr. Dudley's research on the REM signal peptide of the mouse mammary tumor virus. Both on the podcast and in the literature, it was mentioned the REM peptide, in order to be functional, must enter the ER, have its signal peptide cleaved. After it enters the ER, it is, it is then pulled out by the misfolded protein surveillance machinery, and then it is localized to the nucleus where it serves as both a nuclear export sequence and a nuclear import sequence. Since you mentioned it was pulled out by machinery which searches for misfolded proteins, I was curious if you know how the protein avoids ubiquitination after being removed from the ER. 
Of course, I don't know the answer, so I asked Jackie. And her response is, Sean asks an excellent question, and we do not know the exact answer. That's actually a redundant se- uh, uh, sentence. Usually when a, scient- <laughs> when a scientist tells you it's an excellent question, it means they don't know the answer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> to clarify, REM has an unusual signal peptide with both NLS and NES motifs for nuclear function and RNA binding, nuclear localization signal, and nuclear export signal. The signal peptide directs REM translation to the ER membrane. Nevertheless, REM function requires signal peptidase, signal peptide cleavage from the REM precursor using signal peptidase, which is located in the ER lumen. After REM cleavage, the peptide can be extracted from the ER membrane using the ER-associated degradation process also known as ERAD. Isn't that something the Marines say? <laughs> oh. ERAD is crucial to avoiding overloading the cells with misfolded or misassembled proteins, such as in Alzheimer's disease. Signal peptide extraction from the ER membrane requires the AAA ATPase P97, which is part of the retrotranslocon, a channel in the ER membrane. Usually, proteins are identified for retrotranslocation and proteasome degradation, that's the ERAD process, by modification of a target protein with chains of the ubiquitin peptide. We have not been able to detect ubiquitin chains on REM signal peptide. We also expressed REM in a cell line that is defective in part of the pathway needed for ubiquitination, and REM is processed and functions normally in these cells. These results suggest that REM signal peptide is retrotranslocated in a ubiquitin independent manner. We now have a collaboration with a lab that studies how polypeptides are identified for degradation by the proteasome. They are testing whether REM lacks a handle or sequence that the proteasome uses to grab prior to routing them into the enzymatic chamber where they can be degraded. Lack of this handle may allow REM to avoid degradation. I hope you got that. <clears throat> this also makes my head hurt. <laughs> well, she basically explained his question, right? Restated yeah, it, with right all on. the background, and then said what, what she thinks is going on. Yeah, so only right. she would have that insight, so that's right. why. Uh, absolutely. And and basically, I mean, he's hit on a, uh, a, a, a good question, and this thing avoids the uh, ubiquitin pathway. Sounds right. like uh, REM has figured out its own way to snake through all this. Right. Yeah. All right, let's do some picks of the week. I couldn't believe it when you said we were done with the last email. Time flies when you're yeah, having fun. Yeah, it's suddenly an hour and mm-hmm. a half. Wow. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, let's see. What do I have? Let me scroll down to It'll that. It'll take you 10 minutes boy, to scroll boy, down. Boy, do we have a lot more email. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to it eventually. Um, my pick is a website by a couple of hobbyists in the UK. It's called Stratodine. Um, and this is their space program. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. These people are just, as their hobby, uh, this couple, uh, both of them are, are into space. Uh, they're interested in uh, what's going on in the upper atmosphere and further up. So they have started building these uh, weather balloons and launching payloads up into near space, uh, 70,000, 100,000 feet into the air. Um, And they've got a whole series of of pictures and uh, blog posts about, I think they've done three launches so far. Um, They send various sensors uh, up with these things, and um, they've got aerial photos from various altitudes taken by these balloons that they've built and launched. Um, and the, the one they did most recently, it's got a little uh, little Santa and reindeer figurine on it. They've got that pictured uh, with the curvature of the Earth in the background. Um, so that, was, <laughs> that was just, just for that. You have to uh, get uh, FCC clearance to do this sort of thing? Uh, well, they, they're in the UK. They need to get the aviation authorities. In the US, you'd need the FAA uh, Sorry, clearance. Sorry, why did I say FCC? Well, uh, the I meant FCC, FAA. The FCC could matter depending on how you're communicating with the thing. Yeah. Uh, so what a lot of people do, this this has become 
um, a common thing for ham radio operators to get involved with in recent years. But usually it's being done by a school, a university, or sometimes a high school will have a project where they'll do something like this. What impressed me about this is this is just a couple of folks who thought this stuff was cool and yeah. they've got this little amateur science program <laughs> going on that they and the, the gear for it has gotten so small and cheap that you can just uh you know a lot of people can now just self-finance and build these things and launch them i think they ought to talk to jeff bezos <laughs> yes this is this is really an intense hobby yes yeah they've got and they enlist friends and family they've got some pictures um of of launches going on, they've got you know fifteen people lined up holding the various parts of this thing. Ah, it says here uh, permission for a high altitude balloon launch is required from the Civil Aviation Authority. Yes, this is standard procedure and can be applied for online. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so you have to clear cool. it with the FAA and uh, in the U.S. and the appropriate authorities in your home country, so nobody flies into it. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have a new book. Uh, by uh, Polixeni Potter, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, P-O-L-Y-X-E-N-I, it's a Greek name, and the CDC. Um, anybody who is familiar with the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, will know that each issue comes out with a piece of art on the cover chosen by one of their senior editors, uh, Polixeni Potter, who has a background uh, in art, and she always writes a uh, a one or two page bit on the back about the artist uh, and about the painting that are really uh, very good. I really like them. And then uh, makes uh, some attempt uh, with varying success, but always laudable, to connect the uh, art to the theme of the magazine. And um, I'm really happy that she has now uh, put all this together into a volume and published it that has uh, you know, covers from the past, I don't know how many years, lots of them, and the write-ups that went with them. And they're really terrific. It's really nice. That's cool. Sort of in a Indeed. coffee table hardback format. I, I just got a calendar from uh, the e uh -huh. a, this journal. I don't yep. know. If you do any reviewing, you get stuff, and one of them is a calendar where every month they have one of these uh, cover arts there. It's pretty cool. I have learned... Well, I just really like this. It's a very eclectic collection of art that comes on these. I always read these when I get yep. them. Yeah, I like That's them cool. too. They're good. Hey. Kathy, what do you have? Uh oh, I'm pasting in links <laughs> elsewhere. Um, you can wait if you want. So now I have to scroll down. And now my computer's not cooperating. Okay. You want me to do it for you? I, I, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there, I'm there now. I've been all um, over this pick. This is great. <laughs> this is a. It's called sorting algorithms visualized, and uh, it's uh, a computer thing. I guess it's part of every first uh, computer programming course is to start working on sorting al algorithms of things from smallest to biggest, and there are different algorithms, and there there are video visualizations of them with different sound, which you might find annoying or turn it down or something. But um, they're just really cool because they show all the different ways that you can have a computer program sort things. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was fun to watch and, and fun to think about. And there are some links there that explain it further if you're uh, so inclined. But then I was thinking back to, you know, just it, my high school jobs ended up where I was alphabetizing a lot of papers of things. I was in accounts payable. <laughs> and, you know, there's different ways that you can alphabetize things. You could sort everything first by letter and then, or you could just start and sort of have a whole alphabet and then just put things in as you find them. And and so it's a manual way of thinking of the same thing that the computer is doing here. There's lots of ways to sort. Just I, to I, I really like this. I watched the whole thing and immediately posted it on my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's pretty cool. Un yeah. Under the heading Nerd Alert, uh, <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. Good. That's cool. I'm, I'm engrossed in it. That's why I'm not. <laughs> All right. My pick is a page called Pixel Genes, Personal Genetics Meets Urban. I lost it. Urban Art. And uh, I have to say, I stole this from a 
someone on our Facebook page who posted it. Uh, it is a page where they take DNA sequences of an organism, let's say a uh, a duck, and then they give each uh, base a different color and put the whole sequence together on a picture of a duck. And they make artwork <laughs> with they make artwork with the sequence on it. So you can go and check out all the various things they do. So here we have a duck with actually H5N1 sequence on it. We have a pandemic piggy bank, horse, a tree, all sorts of things with DNA sequences. Pretty cool. Kind of cool. Dengue. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Look at this. What you got? There's a sequencing gel. Yeah, there's a sequencing gel. I right? have always thought that a sequencing gel would make a great piece of art. Yeah. There you go. 50, 50 pounds. 50 pounds. You don't do it. They I don't do these. You know what? I used to have hundreds of these. Yeah. I threw them all out. Yeah. When I went to my sabbatical, the, you the could way. have funded so much research yeah. with it. I, I am so sad now because I don't have one to show people of how I, I took a year of my life to sequence polio. I got a few. Uh, <laughs> I I still uh, here's a nerd alert. I have sequencing gels in my basement. Oh. Of how sad? No. You're so lucky. Are they really yeah. nice? Some, yeah. Some, you know, no. You know, the, yeah, of course. That's, that's how sequencing. <laughs> oh, that's great. You hold on to those, the good ones. Oh, because, yeah. um, you know, the big sheets of film, right? With the nice, yeah, many, yeah. many lanes with beautiful 14 results. 14 by 17, yeah. Oh, yep. yeah, yeah. That's really great. Someday. I, and, I, uh, and I think I have some uh, T1 fingerprints from my PhD ooh, thesis, too. Cool. Yeah, I have, my yeah. thesis has those in it, but I don't have any of the original gels. Um, when, I arrived, when I arrived for my sabbatical, there was a uh, first thing that happened was there was a going away party for Claire Moore, who had been working on uh, polyadenylation. So she had a bunch of gels that were like sequencing gels. And somebody, as a going away gift, raided her old pile of gels and made a lampshade. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> ah. Things And it was terrific. It was really cool. Dad, Kathy, why don't you sell the sequencing gels? There you go. I, go evidently, go. I could. Go yeah. on eBay and put them up. <laughs> so it's interesting. You and I both did uh, RNA sequencing, Wandering Spot. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, yeah. no, I didn't do Wandering Spot. I just did T1 fingerprinting. T1. I did that yeah. too, yeah. Yeah. But I also did Wandering Spot, which is horrible. Yeah. All right. We had a couple, We had a listener pick already, right? We did... We, you heard one. And then we have another from Judy, our teacher friend in San Diego, who writes, I know the Twivites like these bio photos. Here are some more. And she gives a link to the um, a, a photography contest, uh, which is an Olympus one. There are lots of these. Nikon has one, too. And this is one um, Olympus Bioscapes imaging competition, which was won by a Janelia Farm researcher. Beautiful picture. Here, the image of an aquatic carnivorous plant. Neat. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, you, I'm in San Diego, December 16th, 71 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 degrees Celsius, sunny, 19% humidity, 2 miles per hour wind. You know, it's always 70 degrees and sunny in San Diego, mm -hmm. isn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. You guys are... Well, in, no, it's not? No, no. There's uh, night and morning low clouds for May and June. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're called, night and morning low clouds. You guys are in hot. snow, 31 degrees Fahrenheit, zero C, 43% humidity, but we both have two mile per hour winds. Yeah, <laughs> it's about where it ends there. Okay, thank you, Judy. And um, you can find Twiv at iTunes, twiv.tv. And as I always say, please go over there if you haven't already and leave comments and stars to help us stay more visible so we can uh, get the public engaged in science. And we'd love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. <clears throat> Learned a lot. Are you going anywhere? Nope. Hanging out here Cool for the holiday. Are you going to get snow next week? I don't know. It's all, all over the place, the weather. Warm, cold. Yep. No nice. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Great time. And you're going to Oregon. I am indeed. Sunday. I'm for, out of here. For how long? A couple weeks? A couple weeks. Wow. With a 60% uh, of my offspring and their offspring. 
That's so like, that'll be good. That's like 60 people, right? Because you have 100 kids. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people, yeah. And a bunch of my wife's family as well. It's going to be a pretty big deal. Have fun. Yeah, I will. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. You going anywhere? Uh, no, we'll go down to my in-laws' place in um, uh, in New York, but that that'll just be a day trip. Well, have fun. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere either. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some rest. You yeah. have fun too, and do get yeah. some rest. I I'm, I always have fun. Actually, <clears throat> every day Good. of my life, I have fun. Good. But that doesn't mean I can't complain. <laughs> well, complaining is fun, too. It is you know, fun. It's part of the deal. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>